Stable Diffusion, DALI, Mid Journey. Those are all image generation models you've heard of. But have you ever wondered how those models are trained? What it takes to generate beautiful images? It is, in fact, a fascinating topic. During the first few hours of training, the model only knows how to generate splashes of color. Add 1,000 hours, and you can already see shapes. Add a bit more training, and you can already discern the shape of objects. 40,000 hours later, you get this beautiful image of a bottle of wine on a marble table and you even get the reflection for free. You might be wondering how I know that. Well, this is because at Photoroom, we have trained an image generation model from scratch with a custom architecture and a custom data set. Photoroom is a French company with employees all around Europe and users all around the world. We help sellers and e-commerce shops generate images that sell. Well, you might be asking, why did we need to train a model from scratch? Why didn't we use an image generation model off the shelf? The first reason was to prevent us from any form of nudity and violence in the model. This is a big issue for our users, and we make sure the model doesn't see any images like this, so it doesn't learn. Ambition, of course. We aim to be the world leader in image generation for e-commerce, and we didn't think we could do that without a custom model. And the main and more, most important criteria was to be able to control the speed quality trade-off. This was only possible with a custom architecture. All right, this might seem a little bit abstract. So I'm going to show you this model in action. It is time for a demo. All right, so I'm going to take this image of a chair, and I'm going to drop it in our app. Grab it here, put it right there, and there you go. We immediately remove the background. Then. I'm going to select a feature called AI Background. And instantly, it's going to put my chair in a studio realistic environment. I heard that Halloween is around the corner, so how about we put the chair in a spooky background? Just wait a few seconds, and there you go. You get this beautiful image generated as if it was shot in a photo studio. And if you're not happy with that result, if this is a little bit too much for you, well, you can just erase the background, put one of your brand colors, like this one, and ask a model to generate a realistic 3D shadow. Let me show you. There you go. In just one click, we get this shadow as if it was shot in a photo studio. So how do we train models like this? This is what I'm going to teach you today. The first part of this talk is about training, what it takes to train a model. And the second part is about how to deploy it to millions of users around the world. But first, how does a diffusion model work? Actually, I'm wondering, does any one of you know how diffusion works? Please raise your hand. OK, quite a few people. Interesting. Um, my, my next question is, um, do you know, uh, have you ever trained, sorry, a diffusion model? Anyone in the room? OK, a bit less people. Well, in one minute, here's my one minute primer on how those models are working. It all starts from noise. Random pixels that are generated purely with a random generator. And then the diffusion process is iterative. It means it takes several steps to go from this noise pattern to a beautiful image. 
So you tell the model, take the noise pattern, and move a little bit in the direction of the image. You pass it text in order to orient it in the right direction. This was the first step. And then you iterate. You move on to the next step, a little bit less noisy. And then on to the last step, your beautiful image. This process takes from 20 to 50 steps for most models. But this is how the image is generated. But how do we train a model? Well, you go the other way around. You start from an image, you noise it just a tiny bit, and then you tell the model, here's the original image, here's the same one with a little bit of noise, now you can learn how to go back to the image. And you do this in an iterative manner until the model, the model learns how to generate the image. So there you go. You now know how diffusion model generates images. Well, in practice, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And that's what we're going to cover in this first part. The very interesting advantage of this technique is that you only need images and text. So if you manage to collect millions of images and annotate them with text, you can train your own model. In this first part, we are going to cover the three key ingredients to training a diffusion model. The first one is compute. The chips and the computing power you are going to need to train it. The second ingredient is algorithms. What is the architecture of your model? How big is it? And the third ingredient, and maybe the most important, is data. All right, let's start with compute. Does anyone have an idea of what is in this huge box? Taking guesses? NVIDIA GPUs, anything else? All right, I heard A100. This is, in fact, an H100. So it's a DGX H100. It contains eight of those mighty chips. Those are power hungry. The H100 consumes 700 watt of power per chip. They are quite expensive, too, from 30 to $40,000. And they come in those machines eight by eight, so eight chips per machine. To train a diffusion model, we have used quite a lot of those. Not eight, but 256 H100. You can imagine this amount of chips is quite power hungry. This is the power usage of our training cluster. You can see that most of the time it's at 100%. This is from the past week. We've had a few issues with training. Sometimes they crash, sometimes we're changing the architecture. And this is why you see the curve going down a little. But this is still a lot of power. When running at full power, this is as much as 600 French households, if you compare the energy usage during the full year. For this reason, we have located our data center in Europe near an hydroelectric plant, so that the CO2 impact, CO2 emission impact, is limited. All right, so we have covered computes. We're now going to move on to algorithms. How do you pick your model? Well, when it comes to picking your model, the first decision you have to make is the size. If we look back at the previous diffusion models, the first one was stable diffusion. It was around 1 billion parameters. The second one that they released was stable diffusion v3, a bit bigger at around 7 to 8 billion parameters. Flux, re released recently, was at 12 billion. At Photoroom, we optimize for speed. That's why our first model was quite small, in order to generate almost instantly. Our next iteration of the model is 8 billion. And you will notice that many models are around 7 to 8 billions. 
This is because this size is almost perfect for training on H100 GPUs. You do less data exchange between GPUs, and this is why models like Llama or diffusion models are around this size. Why wouldn't we pick the busiest model possible? Well, it's because there's a trade-off. The faster the model is, the lower the quality of the image generated. The bigger it is, the more beautiful your images are, but the longer your users have to wait. So it's really a compromise between those two. All right, so you've picked the size of your model. Now you have to decide on the architecture. Well, historically, diffusion models were using the UNET architecture. It's quite old by machine learning standards. It's from 2015. Yet, Stable Diffusion was using this in their first iteration. Since then, more modern architecture have popped up. In fact, you've probably all heard of them. They are called transformers. Who in this room has trained transformers? Please raise your hand. All right, quite a few people. Interesting. Well, transformers are mostly applied to large language models, but they can also be used for image. And in fact, that was the point of this paper, applying the transformers to image models. And it's been one year now that most diffusion models are using the vision transformer. And they get much better results, because the transformer has a full visibility on the whole image, so generate more consistent images. All right, so you have the size of your model, you know how to pick the architecture. We now move on to the most important ingredients, data. There's a saying in machine learning. It goes garbage in, garbage. Oh, OK, you got it, garbage in, garbage out, exactly. If you put bad data as an input of your model, you will get bad data out. This is why filtering your content is extremely important. This is how we do it at Photoroom. The first step is to collect the images. But there's a lot of them. In fact, if you were to download the data set that was used to train stable diffusion, it's called Lion, you would end up with 50 gigabytes of data just for the URLs of the images. So no images yet, just the URLs. If you want to download all the images, you would end up with 250 terabytes of data, quite a lot. And that's not easy to manage. So this is why we've put together a system, an architecture, in order to manage and filter all of this data. The first step is collecting. We partner with stock image photography companies, and we collect as much data as possible. The next step is filtering. We remove any form of violence, nudity, as well as images that are not aesthetically pleasing. We then store the collected and filtered images in a vector database. If you have ever worked with CSV files where you didn't know what columns were in, if you ever lost data when training a model, if you were ever wondered why your data is all over the place, having it in one single location is a godsend. It has been extremely helpful in our quest to train a model. This vector database allows us to have all of our data in one single location and also annotate data that is not annotated yet. So we ask the database, please give me all the images missing a description, a caption, and then we process it with GPU processors, models running on GPU, and we put it back in our database. We can compute statistics on the amount of images, the categories, the tags. This is extremely powerful. And then, when it comes to training, we need to export the data. When training a diffusion model, they are quite data hungry. They can intake up to 10,000 images per second. This is why you need to compress all of your data and put it in one single location. It's a little bit like a zip file, if you will. And so 
we are exporting our data with a custom software written in Go that allows us to bypass Python's performance limitations. The great news is that most of this stack is open source or about to be open source. We have already open source DataGo, our data exporting framework, and we are about to open source DataRoom, which is our vector database to manage images. So they are already on GitHub. Feel free to add a star. All right, you now know the three key ingredients to training a diffusion model. We can now move on to how to deploy it to millions of users. The most important part is your infrastructure. Serving those models requires GPUs. To give you an example, this is the amount of requests that are received by one of our models. The amount at the bottom, uh, on the right, is the amount of images received every second, from 300 to 400. And it varies throughout the day. So we have to adapt. So if we have a user, or many, many users, sending us requests, we need to al alter the amount of GPUs that are available to receive those requests. To give you an analogy, it's a little bit like cash desks in a supermarket. If you have not enough cash desks open, well, your clients will wait in the queue. If you have too many, well, the cashiers will be idle, and that's not good for your business. Well, that's the same thing here, except that the laws vary intensely throughout the day. And so you might be wondering, why don't you add GPU on the go when the demand is too high? Well, this is because adding GPU can take time. It's not instant, so you cannot precisely follow the load. And on top of that, GPUs are quite rare. It's a scarce resource at the moment, especially at large cloud providers. So you really have to strike uh, a trade-off between those two constraints, the speed for your users and the amount that you spend on GPUs. And for us, the speed is the most important factor. This is why we are always, always optimizing our models to be as fast as possible. We are doing two things. We are doing step distillation. Step distillation is a bit different from the classic distillation in machine learning. You teach the model to generate images in less steps. So it's not a smaller model, it's just that it's faster at generating. We are using a technique called LCM to do this distillation. And the second important technique that we're using is called compilation. Compilation allows us to run the model sometimes as fast as 2x faster. How does it work? Well, we are fusing the operations of the model using a framework called TensorRT. To give you an example, if you had to run an operation like A times C plus B times C, you would fuse it into A plus B times C, saving one multiplication, and therefore making your model faster. This framework is essential to making our models fast. All right, so you now know how to train a model. You now know how to deploy it. You are ready to ship your first diffusion model. What is next for Photoroom? Well, we want to train an even larger, faster, and more realistic model for our users while maintaining the speed. Thankfully, we have received the help of France 2030 for this project, and we're incredibly excited on what is coming next. What is next for you? Well, you can go on GitHub and star our repositories if you're interested in datasets at a large scale. And as a conclusion, I would like to thank the machine learning team at Photoroom. This is their work. Nothing about this would have been possible without them. So it's really a team effort. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to come talk to me after the talk. Thank you.